Hello and welcome to another edition of Diaspora Network, the show that celebrates Nigerians who are excelling in the diaspora in various fields. On the show today, we dive deep into the world of fashion. We take a look at the compelling stories of Nigerian designers whose collections and pieces are influencing global fashion trends. And then our cameras traveled all the way to New York City, where we found the renowned Niyi and Demola Okuboyejo. Their unique partnerships and collaborations with global fashion brands are described by so many as phenomenal. And of course, we caught up with the activities of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission. We have a lot to show you in the next 30 minutes or so, but let's take a quick look at the news of the week. Last weekend, the 31-year-old Nigerian-American rapper Tyler the Creator won the Grammy Award for Best Album of the Year, beating Drake, Kanye West, J. Cole and Nas to take the trophy home for his 2021 smash hit, Call Me If You Get Lost. Unlike the long list of celebrities who were present at the MGN Grand Cardon Arena in Las Vegas, the album has been critically acclaimed since its release last summer. Following embattled Kanye West's sudden withdrawal from the Coachella Festival lineup, the widely imaginative rapper has been tipped to replace him. Tyler the Creator has just finished a sold out, successful North American tour. A Nigerian law student residing in London has died after eating just one suspected cannabis gummy and was heard wailing in pain moments after consumption. Damilola Olakami purchased the illegal product through a messaging app and they were delivered to her home in Ilford, East London. She was rushed to hospital via air ambulance but tragically died just four days later. A 21-year-old friend who was also taken ill has now been discharged from hospital. A special post-mortem examination is due to take place to ascertain the exact cause of death. A 37-year-old man from South London has appeared in court, charged with possession and intent to supply Class B synthetic cannabinoid. The Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences has selected a new president following a nationwide search. Dr. Toyin Tofade, a dean and professor at the Howard University College of Pharmacy in Washington, D.C., will begin her term as the pharmacy school's 10th president on July the 1st. She becomes the first black woman to serve as president in the college's 141-year history. During her tenure at Howard University, which began in 2016, the college has nearly doubled enrollment for the class of 2021, doubled the number of student internships, and expanded clinical, industrial and international partnerships. Under her leadership, the college has also diversified its faculty composition and expertise, revised the curriculum, which has led to improved educational outcomes and developed partnerships with the pharmaceutical industry, yielding postdoctoral fellowship opportunities for Howard graduates. Juliana Olayinka with the Diaspora Network News Wrap in London. The Nigerians in Diaspora Commission in recent times have been speaking about capturing diaspora remittances, particularly those from the informal sector, through various engagement strategies. Let's take a look. As the world grapples with the humanitarian fallout of the war in Ukraine, the chairman of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabiri Erewa, has condemned the profiling and detention of Nigerians and other Africans in the detention centers in Poland. She made the comments at a two-day preliminary psychosocial trauma clinic for evacuees organized by NITCOM in partnership with the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, Internally Displaced Persons and Project Victory Corps initiative in Abuja. Mrs. Dabiri Erewa pointed out that in spite of the measures the government has put in place for the voluntary evacuation of Nigerian citizens caught up in the war, the treatment being meted out to those who chose to stay back is unacceptable and reprehensible. Some went to Poland and refused to come back and are not properly documented and now locked up in detention centers under very inhumane condition. Now they are being locked up in detention centers because of the color of their skin. The whites are not being locked up in detention centers, but blacks that are being that are in Poland are being arrested. 
They will tell you you don't have a documentation, although you are a refugee that freed from Ukraine, and they are being locked up in very terrible circumstances in detention centers in Poland. This is unacceptable. Everybody should reject it and tell the Polish authorities, release those you put in detention centers. Then what you can do is send them back to their countries. While narrating their experience, the president of Nigerian students in Ukraine commends the federal government through its different ministries, as well as the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission for the prompt response and rescue of students from Ukraine. The situation was very brutal. It was uh, terrible experiences for most of us. And I just want to thank the people that uh, came to our rescue. I think the first people I'm going to thank is uh, Nidcom and I want to thank you so much, Moni, uh, for, for uh, aiding us. I think they were the first people that reached out. Uh, immediately the situation started. I was just getting messages, you know, people from different uh, places that oh, we are Nidcom officials. We want to help you guys. We want to help you guys. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. President. Uh, the president of Nigeria. Uh, I would like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the minister specifically. Meanwhile, the Zamunsa Association USA, a group of Nigerians from the northern part of the country, resident in the United States of America, and known for their contributions to development through humanitarian programs, has commended NITCOM for its exemplary diaspora relations at the second phase of the association's benevolent palliative project held in Abuja. Governor Abdullahi Sule of Nasarawa State, who was also a former president of the association, applauded the commission for continuously uniting Nigerians in the diaspora to promote development back home. The NITCOM chair in turn commended the association for its patriotism. Nigeria is in the diaspora. You are an integral part of the development of Nigeria. And that is why anywhere the president travels, it meets with the diaspora. And he keeps telling them, do not forget home. Be our number one ambassadors and do all you can to contribute back home. Thank you, Zumunta, for all you're doing and the much more that you will do. Now that's some food for thought right there. Many are also looking to formalizing remittances that come in from the fashion industry in Nigeria, particularly the work that indigenous artisans do. Now for those who work in the diaspora, let's see how their work is critical to the creative economy at home and of course abroad. The Nigerian fashion industry has grown and indeed morphed over the last decade, gaining international interest. Apart from being known for its diverse, innovative and unique combinations of patterns and textiles, the country is now widely recognized for its creative designers who have fused indigenous fabrics and designs with cutting-edge technology and 21st century marketing. Diola Sego, Maya Tafel, Ade Bakare, Lisa Folawio, Zizi Cardo, Lola Fataroti, and Folake Folari Koka are listed among the top talented Nigerian designers who have become trailblazers in the profession, earning accolades locally and internationally. Today, it's natural for shows held in New York, London, Paris, and Milan to feature pieces that bear the Nigerian imprint, but that's not all. Many notable global personalities like former US First Lady Michelle Obama and celebrities like Beyonce and Lady Gaga have been spotted wearing Nigerian designs. Hey, Anok. Hey. How are you? How are you? In 2005, Nigerian British designer Duro Lowe won the New Designer of the Year Award at the British Fashion Awards and was included in the 2019, 2020, 2021 editions of Power List Ranking, the 100 Most Influential Black Britons. International award winning Nigerian designer Ugochi Waba is another force to be reckoned with in the industry. Statistics show that the Nigerian fashion industry has developed in structure, presence and earnings in terms of diaspora remittances. 
This is commendable, but some say the sector can rake in much more if its potential is fully harnessed. International sponsorships and partnerships have also provided further boost to budding entrepreneurs in the fashion industry. This has accelerated the growth of SMEs, created jobs and promoted creativity, ingenuity and culture. The sector is therefore a critical component of the creative economy and by extension, the Nigerian economy. The industry's output is diverse from traditional, formal to contemporary and casual ties. Quite a number of Nigerian designers have become trendsetters putting the country and African fashion on the international map. Right now, we zeroed in on two Nigerian-American designers who say they do not want to control the narrative through their work, but they prefer to share it. They walk down the streets of New York, looking very unassuming. But in the creative minds of these brothers, a regular district like the streets of Central Park can easily become a runway. So who are they? Ade Okubayejo, artist, designer, and founder of Dobale, based in Brooklyn, and his younger brother, Niyi Okubayejo, founder and creative director of Post Imperial, based in New York and Lagos, Nigeria. While they grew up in Lagos, they are indigents of Ijebode in Ogun State. It's not just their style that caught our attention. It's also the name Post Imperial. I wanted to design something for now and something for tomorrow. And so that's why I came with Post Imperial, like after old regimes, working on now. But then also there was that also um, as, there was also that aspect of wanting to create something that would um, put me on a journey of decolonization and thinking of how do we design something that is fresh from an African perspective? For me, when I think of fashion, I think of fashion or fashion designers as social engineers, right? So we are using a platform to kind of solve some sort of issue or pull something from the zeitgeist to kind of create something that makes sense and makes some sort of meaning, like kind of like shamans, right? And so that's a lot of times, that's how I'm looking at fashion. It's just clothes are just kind of the vehicle to, for us to kind of make that manifesto. Right. But, you know, with him, when he's, he's looking, also looking at like, OK, that's all cool. But like, how does this look on someone? How does it feel on someone? What kind of merchandise can you, you know, add into that to make things look like really cool? For Ade, footwear and accessories make him light up. He talks passionately about working on a capsule for the famous brand Vault by Vans. From the footwear aspect, we designed I, well, I designed three shoes from the, with, with my Vans capsule and each shoe was, uh, each design was intentional from the color palette, the, the prints and the silhouette. Uh, for example, the ones that I'm, I'm wearing, this is the, the Ikoyi Bold Night Sneaker. The reason why it's the, called the Ikoyi Bold Night Sneaker, the, the palette, the color palette is, um, was referenced from the flag of Lagos. The, and if you look at the paneling detail, the black and white, that's tied into the, the street curves in, in Lagos. Um, the other shoe, is we, it's a black shoe, it's called the, uh, it's actually behind me, it's called, uh, we, that's the Koi slip-on model. And that was the, the, the whole inspiration behind that. We wanted, I wanted to create something that would offset the colorful offering that we have in the collection we felt like everything was super colorful so we wanted to have i designed something for uh the simple customer looking to buy into the capsule which i felt like was super colorful but at the same time it's also a play on designer loafers that i would see my uncles wearing in church growing up in nigeria On Diaspora Network, our interview with Niyi and Demola Okuboejo. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to the program. Let's get to know these unique trailblazers a little bit more. I mean, growing up in Nigeria, we had a tight-knit family from playing soccer, bonding with cousins and other family members, um, being around such a fun-filled environment. And, you know, most like most of our peers that I, I went to school with back then, they had aspirations in art. And that pretty much impacted me to follow my dreams in, in art. Our early years growing up, what that was like, it was a lot of playing um, in different avenues. So for example, um, from the nuclear family standpoint, you know, having three brothers and one sister, we always had opportunities to play in the backyard with video games, with us drawing, we were really creative and our um, mom and dad gave us a, an opportunity to actually like express ourselves creatively. But while there was lots of play when they were children, me and Ade talk about being outliers who had to navigate multicultural personalities and racial tension when they first arrived in the United States. A little bit of background, we came here, both of us came here. I came here at 14, he was 16 at the time, and we went to live with our uncle. And so it was such a different time. It was, it, I mean, for us it was, we were trying to, we were still learning about ourselves, we were still trying to understand who we were, right? And now we're done in a place where you add the dynamic of race in the context of America, where it's like you're a black person and within this system, you are an other. In the sense of like racism or race in America, it was a total um, game changer for us. And like, I had to kind of adapt and fit in certain roles in order for me to survive. When I was hanging, when I was hanging with black kids, there was a certain role I had to play when I was hanging with black kids. When I had um, engaged with some of my black, white friends or um, other um, students of color, there was a certain role that I had to kind of play. So I understood from a really early, um, like really early that like, there were certain roles and certain masks that I had to wear. They've come a long way since they were teenagers, with Ni's recent partnership with sports star Yanis Adetokumpo and WhatsApp, in a deal that saw the Milwaukee Bucks forward becoming the first celebrity to sign such an agreement. Um, WhatsApp reached out to me um, about the possible collaboration because they started up a partnership with him and they were thinking about a way to kind of announce that partnership. And so they reached out to me and um, wanted to know if there was a way that I could participate and collaborate with them. So we worked together closely. Um, I created a hoodie that, you know, they really liked and they wanted us to work on it, but we only had like, I'd say like two weeks to put it together. So I had to fly to Nigeria to work closely with the dye artisans that I work with to make sure that, you know, we got the, the thing right. We gave them like super white glove service. Ade also made headlines when the van skate brand beefed up its portfolio via a partnership with him titled Dobale, Forever Sunny in Ipui Footwear and Apparel Collection. Inspired by the sunny disposition of the Nigerian people, their rich foods, as well as the Lagos state flag. The Forever Sunny in Ipui Collection pays homage to my, uh, pays homage to my culture gro uh, growing up in Ipui, Lagos, right? And I wanted to make sure that I designed, that the collection was authentic and true to, you know, true to me and my culture. Like for example, if you look at one of the shoes from my capsule, it has like a camouflage print on it. It has an abstract camouflage print on it. But if you dive deep into what, that, what, what it means, that's actually an abstract print of our, uh, one of our dishes called effort. Right, it's a tradition, it's our traditional spinach dish. You know, it's like if you look at a lot of our uh, cuisines in Nigeria, you, it's, if you look closely into some of, the, uh, some of our dishes, you would see it gives us a lot of like different colors, different patterns, different prints and textures, and you can literally extract out of that to create something special and unique. 
While they've watched each other flourish, there's no sibling rivalry between the brothers who work in such a competitive industry in the same country. I, I think it's, um, it's pretty interesting because we both had different journeys to get here. So for him, he took the unconventional route of, you know, going to art school, focusing on graphic design, and then using, like, starting his own streetwear label to kind of get into the industry. I took the traditional route of actually going to school and like learning. So we all kind of, we both had our like ways of um, basically kind of doing this brain exercise of like what we want to do and how to get to the point that we're at. And so because of that, we, we approach things from a different perspective. We approach fashion from different perspectives. So for example, for him, when he thinks about fashion, he thinks about it from a very um, uh, product driven standpoint or like, oh, we, we, if we talk about fashion shows, for example, he's looking at the things that he could wear, the things that are like that make sense for like from a product perspective. I'm looking at it from what's the manifesto of the designer, what's the aesthetic, what are the things that they are bringing together, what are they trying to, um, what are they basically trying to um, tell us. I think it's pretty cool that although him and I are in the same industry, we both have a different outlook on what fashion speaks, what fashion says to us, whether it's as creatives or whether it's as consumers, right? But I mean, even though, although we both took different routes in our journey, I would say that he definitely played an impact in me working in the industry. Like, I mean, he went to Parsons, he moved to New York, you know, he was doing his thing and, you know, I looked at, I looked, I took it as like a blueprint for like, okay, let me, let me go ahead and move to New York. Let me figure out myself. I, I think he's, he, I mean, he always says that narrative of like me, like moving to New York and like having to figure it out. Like, and then that was like his blueprint. But I, I feel like he already laid the blueprint because he already had Dobale that he had started before I actually yeah. moved to New York. Right. He had done a few, a lot of things that like people in our like circle were not doing. I'm, you know, proud of like the fact that he was able to kind of get to this point without any kind of like traditional way. Because a lot of people, you know, to get this kind of like collaboration, you usually need to have like busy, there are steps that you need to take. And he always talks about hacking and he kind of hacked his way into that space. The post-imperial brand is known for global partnerships and collaborations. We've quite, done quite a few collaborations. We've done collaborations with Mini BMW. We've done collaborations with um, other um, menswear brands like Engineer Garments and um, La Rose Paris. Um, and those are the ones that we've done like uh, collaborations with in terms of like with so La Rose Paris, we did collaborations with hats. Whereas with Engineer Garments, it was a full collection. We broached the subject of the brothers collaborating. This made them smile. We've worked together in the past, but the thing is like, the thing about it is like, our, our, the, the way we look at things is so completely, completely different. But it could happen. It, it could happen, that never say never, but it's so completely different. While global partnerships are good, Ade identifies a paradigm shift among the new generation of designers where the biggest brands on the world stage are now inspired by African designs. A lot of these corporations, they're scrambling to bring us to the table. A lot, you know, from a, a long time ago, there were a lot of gatekeepers, right? And having people like, you know, whether it's like your Virgil's, you know, RIP, but like Virgil Abloh coming in and unveiling a mask and showing like unconventional ways of breaking through those doors and like, whether it's like sitting on the table or creating your own table, right? And shifting, it was like a paradigm shift. It was to a point where these brands, they had to, they had no choice but to like, okay, they had to come meet us. You know what I mean? Because, you know, we dictated the culture for a long time. And, you know, I felt like we were snubbed and ignored for a while. And, and now a lot of these brands are like looking for people like me, people like, that look like me to sit you know, to sit at these tables and like, okay, partner up and like, you know, tell these stories. If you look at the American fashion industry, it's very exploitative and very extractive and extracts talent, it extracts mm -hmm. from yeah. the marginalized groups, right? And also it's very elitist. 
right? And there's a sense of privilege that you need to be able to like pay to play, right? And it creates a very like, it, it creates a system that is not balanced, right? Um, and so I personally don't want to see that for Nigerian fashion. I, I think there's a different way that we can go where there's more um, equality, it's more egalitarian, it's not um, these things where like you have to start up with a point of privilege. And here are their views about the Nigerian fashion industry. I'm really proud of that, um, the impact and I know quite a lot of the designers, you know, people like Kenneth Easy, uh, Moalola and um, you know others like um, Bio from Orange Culture and they, just seeing the different things that they are doing and the different ways that they are approaching fashion from uh, and like connecting it to the Nigerian diaspora so it's awesome to see that there is not any canon on like this is how African fashion should look like but you can still tell that it's African because of the perspective that they're coming from because it makes sense that there isn't any canon because they all have different lived experiences. So it's always awesome to like see like how that has come from like and you know the impact is making globally. It's really inspiring seeing a, a whole new generation of people from my you know from where I'm from honing into their craft rather than going through like a a textbook route right so i think they already they may not necessarily need this message i think they already they already see it it's it's happening all around us have it there's so much more room for designers like these to contribute not just to the creative economy but to help change the narrative of the nigerian work ethic and that's the show you can watch other episodes on our website channelstv.com i'm ijoma Onyato. let's do this again some other time <music>